Hey everybody, welcome back to Monroe Live. Today we have the Hyundai Kona up on the hoist and we are going to introduce another Monroe associate, Kevin Hardy. Kevin has been with Monroe Associates for seven years. He mm -hmm. supported a lot of the, de the development work at a major OEM in the area for Monroe Associates. He's also an avid uh, car owner. How many cars do you own, Kevin? Right now, only three. Three. So, yeah, but. He, he really probably wants a Raptor and a Bronco and an EF-150, but um, he has been a critical part of a lot of our uh, benchmarking work we've done. So we're going to get going and step under the car, and let's kick things off. Alrighty. So Sandy covered the Kia Nero. This is essentially identical on the underbody. So we're gonna dig in a little deeper and show some things that Sandy didn't point out. First thing we notice here is their high voltage output from the battery. So this is headed to the inverter and this is going to the um, high voltage AC compressor. You have your low voltage here for your controls and your thermal in and out. What we noticed is this is lower on the ground plane than the cradle. I've grabbed a level here to show this. It's about an inch lower and this is a little concerning to me because Tesla when they first launched the Model S they had to add an additional titanium protective plate to protect some of the connectors for the cinder block test. So imagine you're driving on the freeway and you hit a cinder block going 80 miles an hour. There is a polypropylene shield that closes us out. But that polypropylene shield is not going to withstand the impact of a cinder block. So I don't remember the battery pack being this low relative to the height of the cradle on the Nero, but we'll have to look more closely at our previous video. Um, moving forward, the K-frame is identical, and Kevin here is going to talk about the SORB strategy, small overlap reinforced Rigid bar barrier. Oh yeah, rigid barrier. So. Like the previous, I um, what we had the, the Hyundai, Kia Nero, Kia Nero, and then the, the Kona. So most of the, the strategy is very similar in a lot of their vehicles, and they're probably at the, quite literally at the bleeding edge of getting away with not having a perimeter cradle. So this is kind of a, an older strategy. There's, there's no small overlap rigid tusks. There's no integration with the, like the front end module or anything like that that we've seen on a lot of other vehicles, um, specifically like rear wheel drive vehicles that often struggle with this test. Um, this vehicle does perform well, at least in the um, non-electric version of it with small overlap rigid barrier. However, when you look through the details of the report out, from a safety cage perspective, it only scores acceptable. So when we look at this in a strategy, it's a very, very defensive strategy, meaning that most of this structure around the very, very outskirts of the, the passenger occupant home is doing the vast majority of the work. So as kind of Corey mentioned with the cradle, we have some double shear brackets present on the other one, a nice kind of SY blend of body structure running back, directing the energy from an impact. But this area of the vehicle is doing a lot of the work for this particular crash um, scenario and it'll be interesting to see from like a mass perspective and future you know vehicle iterations how much longer they'll be able to get away with such a simple strategy and it is simple there's a lot to be said for this it's it is elegant and it is very very cost effective um, so. now hyundai and kia do not always uh, cut costs to go to the lowest cost option if you look at the knuckle so this knuckle is a very refined forging. Now, Kevin, you were saying it was a certain type of forging. So it, it might be like a cobalt press, which is kind of a proprietary consideration, but you can tell like just the surface finish, the, the overall area that it occupies is very small and just it's, it's extremely efficient in its layout. They're only using three bolts, one, two, three, four, and they are internal torques. So when you have an internal torques, that's actually a lighter option from a weight perspective than an external torx, which adds mass, or even a standard hex. Now, moving back to the EDM, the electric drive module, when I drove the Kia Nero, I noticed a significant amount of torque steer. This is front wheel drive, it's only front wheel drive, but notice the output of the gearbox is not centered. 
it's biased to the left. So this half shaft right here and that half shaft are different lengths. So what you're gonna get, what you're gonna get is as the vehicle applies torque through the differential, this axle can flex more than that, so you can get an uneven distribution of how the torque is applied to the ground, which will give you a feeling that you're pulling one way or the other, depending on how the torque is applied. Um, Sandy pointed out that the high voltage AC compressor is mounted to this EDM, electric drive module. Now, it's a trade-off because by mounting it directly to the EDM, you save inefficient mounting bracket strategy. This is from the Ford Mustang Mach-E. So they have a large aluminum bracket with four mounting provisions bolted, I believe, to the rail. And then you have a probably a nylon glass filled it's pretty high. bracket yep, with four integrated isolators mounted to that bracket and then the AC compressor. Um, from an NVH perspective, you do not want this AC compressor making a lot of noise and transferring that back to the cabin because this AC compressor on the Hyundai Kona is <laughs> mounted to the EDM, you get the advantage of the isolator. So there's two isolators up on the rail and then one right here. So they can handle that vibration with the same isolators for the electric drive module. Now here's the negative part. The lines. So the high pressure line and the low pressure line exit on the left side of the vehicle under the rail. And you can see it's about five inches, another five, so 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35. You're looking at a 40, 40 to 50 inch line just to get to the right side of the vehicle to interface with the connection of the thermal expansion valves, the chiller, the condenser, and then we, we can't actually, you can get in there and see it. The lines will then route up the rail over into the thermal expansion valve for the HVAC for your AC, you know, for your air conditioning. That's a huge disadvantage. Tesla, I know everybody gives me a hard time. They, they say I'm a Tesla homer or lover or whatever. Tesla mounts their AC compressor directly behind the frunk. And this is the length of the lines from the AC compressor to the super manifold. The super manifold houses all of the components that these lines are trying to get to. And then it exits the super manifold and there's a short line right to the cabin for not only heating but cooling. Um, this is an example of a poor location, but I believe that Hyundai and Kia would rather pay the money for the long lines than have a complicated MVH strategy and bracketing. And since we're still talking about MVH, when we had a, a few employees drive this car around the block to get in here, they notice a significant amount of tip in wine, electric motor noise as it was coasting down or accelerating. This electric motor does not have any NVH wrapping. This is the NVH wrap from the Ford Mustang Mach-E. So this is a lower price point vehicle. Actually, no, it's not. It's 43 grand. So it typically is a lower price point vehicle. I just canceled out my own point. Sorry about that. <laughs> it would be interesting to see, you know, the meeting of where they're just discussing and how much control they really do have, you know, from whether a supplier standpoint or anything like that, of mounting this. It's a good strategy. Location is poor. And then obviously them trying to balance out where it runs in a vehicle. You know, there, there yeah. could be roughly enough room to get over here, shortening the run, but uh, there's clearly yeah. some compromises. And on Monroe Live, I'm talking to our subscribers now, our goal is to show you these fine intricacies and decisions that are made at the OEM level. It may not matter to anyone. When you go buy a Hyundai or a Kia or a Tesla or a Ford Mustang Mach-E, you get in and you drive that electric vehicle. What does this actually affect? It's adding weight, it's mm -hmm. adding cost, and it is affecting your range. So you see vehicles with similar size batteries 
as a Model 3 or a Model Y that are getting 70 or 80 miles less range. Why is that? Our job is to discover all of the micro decisions that add weight, cost, and inefficiency that are a drag, no pun intended, on the range. All right, now we're gonna move to the rear. There's a couple of things in the rear suspension. All right, Kevin, now we're gonna look at the rear suspension. So what do you see from just a basic geometry standpoint? So, you know, we have a, it's a relatively conventional layout. As we kind of mentioned with the front, we have a extremely efficient, you know, forged aluminum knuckle. Um, one of the things that you were pointing out before when we were discussing with this, um, this toe link here, it's, it's, it's cheap and efficient. It's just some stamp folded steel. There's not even a seam weld going down it. Um, they're relying on mostly the, the shape to give the, uh, the rigidity that they need from the performance of this link. And the twist blade. Yes. What we call this. Um, you know, obviously we don't like fasteners here and more often than not, if this is not like part and assembly to the overall knuckle assembly, which is prevalent on some vehicles, you'll see three bolts here. So they are able to get away. They have like a slight you know, nesting feature here. At one point in time, they may have had it, but they have been able to potentially get out that additional fastener, which is something that we key into. So two versus three. And then we noticed, I think Sandy pointed that, this out. This is a decking feature. This is a hard mounted, rear cradle and it's very small. So if you look at more modern rear cradles, they've gotten much larger with large isolators, similar to the front. So the front was an isolated K-frame. This rear is hard mounted. Sandy said that he thought that this reminded him more of a good 90s car. This reminds me of my 1990 Nissan Maxima because I had a hard mounted rear cradle <coughs> and I had a hard mounted front K-frame, but it looked very similar to that. Anything else in the rear? So one of the things uh, I do really like is, you know, for their camber adjustment, you have just a piercing within the stamping right here where they cut. There's not a separate bracket. It's all part and assembly. It's, it's efficient. It's lightweight. Um, it's, it's so elegant. for the, those like people it. who don't know, uh, can you describe how that would be adjusted? Yeah. So this kind of like a, this bolts on a, like an, an eccentric profile. So you would lock, you know, the, um, uh, You'd, you'd measure obviously the wheel on a, on a laser rack and then essentially you could rotate this and this adjusts the distance you know, between um, the cradle hard points itself and the lower control and kind of pick up points and you can align the, the camber for the vehicle itself. But uh, oftentimes you'll see this as a, a separate assembly but this is, it's elegant, it's, it's integrated into the, the actual stamping itself. Yeah, and if you look at the battery pack here, it's no mystery that it is a Hyundai or Kia. You can see right here, it says Hyundai Kia Mobis down there. So exactly the same kilowatt hour rating on this battery, um, same electric drive module, same horsepower, but this vehicle does get a roughly 10 miles better MPGE. So it'd be interesting to figure out how they got that. And I think this is uh, about all we squeezed out of the undercarriage. Um, Kevin, I want to thank you for coming yeah, on. Yeah, no problem. Um, thanks for watching Monroe Live. We really appreciate it. A little bit of update, Model S Plaid, November. I know that many of you contributed. We really appreciate the funding. We have the funding squared away. The vehicle's on order. Unfortunately, we're at the mercy of uh, the chip shortage or whatever, and that is when we expect the Model S Plaid. So we appreciate you watching. Have a nice day.